Let's uh, welcome Don Song as our first invited speaker. Hi, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, such a great honor and pleasure to be here. Um, today I will talk about AI and security, challenges, lessons, and future directions. And I'm a professor at UC Berkeley and also a founder and CEO at Oasis Labs. We all know that deep learning is making great advancements. For example, AlphaGo has won over world champion, and deep learning is empowering everyday products. However, on one hand, we are seeing the exponential growth of the power and applications of deep learning. On the other hand, in the landscape of computer security, we are seeing another trend where we see that attacks are increasing in scale and sophistication. For example, recently we have seen massive distributed denial service caused by attacks on IoT devices called the Mirai botnet, which has compromised over 400,000 IoT devices over 160 countries. And at its peak, the attack was over, 100, uh, over one terabit per second for combined traffic. And also, we continue to see large-scale data breaches in uh, major websites uh, and, uh, and corporations. For example, in the, EQ, uh, in the recent Equifax attack, attackers were able to steal sensitive information about uh, over 140 million users. And also, we are continuing to see attacks entering new landscape, including the power grid, as well as the banking system. So all this tells us that with the both trends, uh, the growing trends in AI and the security, there's a lot of open questions and challenges at the intersection between AI and the security. On one hand, um, we can ask the question, how will the rise of AI alter the security landscape? How will AI help or affect security? And on the other hand, we can ask, how will the security or insecurity impact the deployment of AI? So first, let's look at uh, the first part of the question, how will AI alter the security landscape? The good news is that we are seeing deep learning improving security capabilities in many different areas. For example, in the domain of Internet of Things, we expect huge growth. It's estimated that by the year of 2020, we'll see over 50 billion devices deployed over the Internet. However, these IoT devices are plagued with vulnerabilities from third-party code. This third-party code uh, can contain vulnerabilities, which then can cause the, uh, these IoT devices to be compromised by attackers. So one key question is how can we discover these, um, uh, these vulnerabilities used in the third-party code, and how can we tell when a firmware of an IoT device actually uses third-party code that contains no vulnerabilities? And we need to do this very fast, and we need to do this when the, um, the third-party code has been included in different types of firmware that is being compiled to different uh, hardware targets. So in our recent work, we use deep learning in particular using neural network-based graph embedding to address this problem, to identify uh, essentially code similarity across uh, different platforms uh, for uh, detecting vulnerabilities in these binary code. In particular, we uh, automatically translate these firmware uh, uh, functions into uh, essentially using the graph embedding uh, into feature vectors and then uh, compare the similarity of these feature vectors to identify whether a firmware file contains uh, a vulnerability function in the third-party code. Using this approach, we significantly improve the uh, state of the art for vulnerability detection in IoT devices. Uh, both in terms of training time as well as assembly time, we achieve orders of magnitude improvements. And also, we have identified real-world vulnerabilities uh, in uh, real-world firmware using this approach and achieve high accuracy. So that's e one example showing how deep learning can help with automatic vulnerability detection. We can also use deep learning to help other tasks in computer security. For example, to de develop automatic agents for attack detection, analysis, and defense. 
as we improve the uh, security of computer systems, unfortunately, one of the fundamental weakness of cyber systems is humans, which actually is very difficult for us to improve. Recent statistics show that over 80% of penetrations and the hacks actually start with a social engineering attack, such as a phishing email. And the question is, how can we actually help protect humans uh, from these social engineering attacks? In deep learning and AI, we often talk about chatbots. We use chatbots for booking flights, for finding restaurants. One question is, can we actually utilize these techniques for something that's even more important? For example, protecting humans from social engineering attacks. In a recent project, and also this is a recent DARPA project, uh, we and also uh, other teams are working on how we can develop chatbots to, defend, uh, to detect and defend against social engineering attacks. In this case, the chatbot can uh, observe the conversation between the recipients and the potential um, attacker and try to detect whether a phishing attack or a social engineering attack is happening and can, during real time, generate dialogues to challenge the uh, potential attacker to validate whether the uh, attacker is someone he uh, claims to be. In addition, we can also look at how deep learning can further help solving security problems. For example, by helping to automatically verify the correctness and security of software. Deep, uh, deep reinforcement learning has been useful <laughs> for many tasks, including training AlphaGo. The question is, for deep learning and deep reinforcement learning, can we use it in addition to just playing games to solve some more important problems? For example, to automatically train agents to prove theorems and use this to help us to automatically prove the correctness and security of programs. In our recent work as a first step, uh, we uh, develop a learning environment uh, in Coq. Uh, in our recent work, GamePad, uh, we uh, look at how we can develop some of these uh, deep learning um, techniques for theorem, for theorem proving. And also there has been a series of work in the space, including uh, earlier work from Google and other places. I think this is also a very exciting uh, domain, looking at how we can use deep learning for improving software security. So that's one direction how AI can help enable new security capabilities. On the other hand, also AI needs security. Security can enable better AI. When we talk about machine learning, it's really important to consider machine learning in the presence of attacker for a number of reasons. First, history has shown that attackers always follow the footsteps of new technology development, or sometimes even lead it. And also this time, the stake is even higher with the AI. As AI controls more and more systems, attacker will have higher and higher incentives to compromise AI. And also as AI becomes more and more capable, the consequence of misuse by attackers will also become more and more severe. When we talk about machine learning in the presence of attackers, there are at least two different aspects that we need to consider. One is how attackers may attack AI. Attacker can attack AI in several different ways. One attacker can attack the integrity of AI systems, for example, causing the learning system not to produce the intended or correct results or causing the learning system to produce targeted outcome designed by an attacker in a targeted attack. Attackers can also attack the confidentiality of the learning system to try to learn sensitive information about individuals. To address these problems, we need to improve <laughs> security in learning systems. The other aspect uh, is that attackers can try to misuse AI. For example, Attacker can try to misuse AI to attack other systems, for example, finding vulnerabilities in other systems and devise new attacks. To address these problems, we need to improve security in other systems. So first, let me talk about the first aspect, how attackers can attack the integrity of the learning system. Here, to motivate why this is important, let's look at a concrete scenario. In a scenario of self-driving cars, 
In self-driving cars, as autonomous vehicle drives around, it needs to observe the environment, for example, to recognize traffic signs to make the correct decisions. So these are some photos of actual traffic signs, including a clean traffic sign as well as a real-world traffic sign in Berkeley. And computer, today's computer vision systems actually can do pretty well. They can recognize these traffic signs correctly. However, what if attackers actually try to launch attacks where the attacker can try to modify these traffic signs, for example, putting some uh, innocuous stickers on the traffic sign, and sometimes uh, the, attacker, uh, the modification is so small that you can even barely see it. And these examples, even though to humans, humans can recognize these uh, traffic signs with no problems, uh, these uh, called adversary examples that actually cause the uh, computer vision system to misclassify, and in this case, they are misclassified to speed limit signs. So in one of our recent work, uh, we look at the question, how adversary examples, what adversary examples actually can and be effective in the real world and also can even remain effective under different viewing distances and conditions. So our work demonstrates that the answer is yes, adversary examples can be effective in the physical world and also they can remain effective under different viewing distances and conditions. So here, let me show you a video uh, to demonstrate the point. In the video, you are going to see two frames side by side. Uh, and at the bottom of, of the frame, you will see prediction labels uh, given by the uh, uh, image classification systems. And in one frame, you will see, uh, so the car is driving towards the traffic sign at the end of the road. And the one of, in one of the frames, the traffic sign is the original traffic sign without modification. And in the other video frame, you will see uh, it's the traffic sign that actually uh, has been modified uh, as an adversarial example. And we leave it as a thought exercise, uh, which frame is the original one with no modifications and which one is the attack one. So now let's play the video. So as you can see, as the, camera, as the car drives towards the traffic sign, uh, you can see at the bottom the uh, label given by the image classification system. So let's now just take a quick vote. Uh, so which one is the, uh, 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 the original uh, image without uh, modifications? To the right or to the left? I don't see many hands raising. <laughs> okay, let's play once more. Uh, so as you can see, the, the, the traffic sign is the stop sign uh, when humans raise it. So okay, so which one is the, uh, the attack one? To the left? <laughs> okay, so, so, right, uh, okay, so to your, <laughs> it's to your side, yes. Okay, I, I think everyone got, to, got the point. Okay, so from this example, you can see that um, adversary examples can really cause severe consequences, especially when it's deployed in the real world. And unfortunately, adversary examples is not just limited to image classification systems. They're actually prevalent in deep learning systems. In, uh, so by now, a study from the earlier work uh, from researchers uh, from Google, including Sajidi and Ian Goodfellow, the whole community now actually has been a very active uh, area for studying adversarial examples, and uh, including our, uh, our own recent work. So in our recent work, we have looked at adversarial examples in different application domains, as well as different types of deep learning systems, including generative models, deep reinforcement learning, as well as uh, uh, visual Q&A systems. And also look at new attacks methods. And all the study shows that adversary examples are prevalent in deep learning systems. So here, let me just give you uh, quickly a few other examples. So this is an example in the application domain of visual q &A. In visual q &A, we uh, give the, uh, the system uh, two inputs. One is an image, the other one is uh, a question. So for example, here, the question is, what is a woman feeding the giraffe? 
And so when we feed this to the deep learning system, uh, here it gives the answer carrot, which is correct. And also currently, actually, Berkeley has the state of the art results for this task. And in this work, we essentially study the, <laughs> the state of the art uh, visual KNA model developed at Berkeley. And we wanted to look at how, uh, whether uh, these systems are also vulnerable to uh, adversary example issues. And the answer is yes. So here's an example. So here, uh, the question is, where's the, uh, where's the plane? And uh, here is the benign image. When we feed the benign image to the visual KNA model, it gives the right answer, wrong way. And here, uh, we are asking whether we can actually generate an adversarial example version of the uh, benign image and uh, have the visual KNA model to give the target answer sky. And here's the example of the adversary example uh, of the original image. As you can see, uh, to human eyes, you can better tell the difference. But when we feed this example to the visual KNA model, it uh, produces the target answer sky. Here's another example, how many cats are there? And the VQE model gives correct answer on the benign image, and the answer is one. So now we want to generate an adversary example uh, image for the original image uh, with the target answer two. So again, here is the generated adversary example. When we feed this to the VQE model, it gives the answer two, even though clearly there's only one cat. So here's another example showing how adversary examples can easily fool the deep reinforcement learning uh, trained agents. So here on the, in the original frame, uh, here you see that the, the green pedal is the trained agent is performing very well. But now in the middle frame, we'll show that as we add adversary perturbation to the video frame, in this case, uh, adversary perturbation is so small that you can um, barely, you can't even see it with human eyes. But now the trained agents uh, completely misbehaves and actually reaches minimal score. So these examples are demonstrate the adversarial uh, example phenomena uh, is prevalent in different deep learning systems. And also, now the whole community has also discovered many different ways to generate adversarial examples. So in, for example, in our re recent work, we demonstrated that you can actually use again to generate adversarial perturbations. And the generated adversarial perturbation is uh, also different uh, from the typical methods. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this approach, we are able to generate adversarial examples that actually uh, is the leader on the recent MNIST attack challenge. And uh, we also have, uh, in another example of our recent work, we also generate adversary examples using a different objective function, try to minimize the optical flow uh, called spatially transformed adversary examples. And this type of adversary examples are particularly uh, designed to be uh, essentially uh, to look uh, very much like uh, real world images. And also we demonstrate that this uh, the uh, adversary examples generated in this approach also causes the attention network to actually misplace the attention. So overall, uh, adversary examples uh, just demonstrates, it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's one of the phenomena in the broad domain of adversary machine learning. The domain of adversary machine learning is about learning in the presence of adversaries. And the attacks actually can happen at different stages of the machine learning uh, pipeline. It can happen at inference time, uh, for example, the adversarial examples at inference time try to fool the learning system to make the wrong prediction. And also attacks ha can happen at the training time as well, where attackers can try to poison the training data set to cause the learning system to learn the wrong model. Overall, adversarial machine learning is particularly important for security critical systems. Due to its importance, numerous uh, defense methods have been proposed. For example, just within the last year, there have been over 100 papers published on archive proposing different types of detection and defense mechanisms against adversarial examples. However, today, still, we do not have sufficient defenses against such phenomena. In particular, strong and adaptive attackers can easily, easily evade today's defense, as demonstrated by many of the recent papers in this space, including the best paper awards in this conference. 
I strongly believe that security will be one of the biggest challenges in deploying AI. When we talk about security of learning systems, uh, we need to consider security issues of learning systems at different levels, at, including at the software level, the learning level, as well as the distributed level. At the software level, when we look at the security challenges for learning systems, we want to ensure that there's no software vulnerabilities, such as buffer overflows or access control issues. We want to prevent attackers from taking control over the learning system through exploiting software vulnerabilities. While this is an important problem, uh, at the same time, we have, uh, uh, we, have over, uh, we have decades of experience and techniques and tools developed in this domain to try to uh, e essentially improve the security of software. So the good news here is that existing software security and formal verification techniques apply to help us solve this problem. So the bigger challenges for security of learning systems lies at the learning level and the distributed level. There are many challenges for security at learning level. So first, how do we evaluate the uh, security of the system? We need to evaluate it under adversarial events, not just normal events. So in my security class, when I teach students uh, about software security, we differentiate between regression testing versus security testing. Regression testing tries to run program on normal inputs uh, with the goal to prevent normal users from encountering, uh, encountering errors. Whereas in security testing, we try to run program on abnormal adversary inputs with the goal to prevent attackers from finding exploitable errors. For learning system, we essentially need to do the same thing. We need to differentiate between regression testing versus security testing. So in almost all machine learning papers, when you look at the experiment sections, uh, we are essentially doing regression testing, where we try to test the performance of the learning system on normal inputs to try to estimate generalization error. Whereas for security testing, we need to test the learning system on abnormal adversary inputs, such as the adversary examples that I mentioned earlier, to estimate the resiliency of the learning system against the adversary inputs. We also need to be able to reason about complex and non-symbolic programs in order to have better understanding of security of the learning system at the learning level. The whole community, we are familiar with the symbolic programs, uh, such as operating systems, file systems, compiler, and so on. So for these applications and programs, their semantics are defined by logic, and we have decades of techniques and tools developed for logic and symbolic reasoning including theorem provers, uh, abstract interpre uh, uh, interpretation, and so on. Um, and in fact, we have entered the area of formally verified systems, where we have seen many examples of formally verified systems, including microkernels, operating systems, file systems, and many others. Thanks to the powerful formal verification tools, as well as dedicated teams developed over the last uh, years and decades. Well, for symbolic programs, we still uh, have uh, further work to do to develop techniques and tools to analyze and verify their correctness and security. But at least we have decades of experience already. But however, for learning systems, they are what we call non-symbolic programs. And for these type of uh, <laughs> programs, we have no precisely specified properties and goals. For example, uh, with autonomous vehicles, we would like to specify the goal that it should not run over a pedestrian. But however, we don't even have a precise mathematical definition of what a pedestrian is. And we have no good understanding of how learning systems work. And the traditional sy symbolic reasoning techniques mostly do not apply here. And hence, this is a broad, a, uh, open domain um, with, uh, where the whole community will have very little experience with. Furthermore, we need to be able to design new architectures and approaches with a stronger generalization and security guarantees. So here I'll just briefly mention one of our recent work as a concrete example, as one step towards uh, this question of 
designing new architectures and approaches with a stronger generalization and security guarantees. So this is our recent work in the domain of uh, neural program synthesis. In the domain of neural program synthesis, we try to teach computers uh, how to write code. And uh, with neural program synthesis, here we try to provide, for example, training data. In this case, given the uh, two uh, input numbers uh, uh, with the uh, outputs, the sum of the two numbers. And when we provide the training data to the neural program architectures, it tries to then learn a neural program, uh, hopefully to learn the addition correctly. So when you give it a new test input, the two digits, it can produce a correct uh, test output. And there has been uh, a long string of work in the uh, domain of neural program uh, synthesis for uh, different uh, neural program synthesis tasks. However, most of the previous work uh, suffered from two main challenges. One is generalization. Many of this work have trouble generalizing. For example, if you uh, train the neural program uh, with uh, uh, inputs of 30-digit uh, long, then it may have uh, a trouble uh, with test inputs uh, that's uh, of 100 digit long, for example. And also, even when empirically the trained neural programs uh, do <laughs> perform the task correctly, still we have no proof of generalization. In one of our uh, uh, recent work from last year that won the Best Paper Awards at uh, ICLR, uh, we demonstrate that by introducing recursion, by learning recursive neural programs, we can um, address these two main challenges. So recursion is a fundamental concept in computer science and math. It solves a whole program by reducing it to smaller programs using reduction rules, all the way down to the base cases, which are the smaller sub-problems, which are much easier to reason about. By using recursion and introducing recursion to uh, neural programs, we show that we can uh, actually, for the first time, provide proof of generalization. Once the recursive program has passed a very, uh, the, uh, once the learned recursive pro program has passed a verification procedure, uh, we can prove that the learned recursive program has uh, actually achieved perfect generalization. Um, and also, we show that. Uh, the uh, recursive uh, neural program also can learn and generalize much faster. This example demonstrates a few lessons. One, program architecture impacts generalization and probability. And recursive and modular neural architectures are easier to reason, prove, and generalize. So our work has just shown one example uh, in the limited domain of neural program synthesis. Uh, uh, it's, uh, oh, uh, yeah, it would be great to actually be able to explore new architectures and approaches to enable strong generalization and security properties for broader tasks. For example, we are exploring uh, the, uh, to further extend the approach in the domain of robotics. For the uh, challenges for security at the learning level, we also need to be able to reason about how to compose components. Building large, complex systems require compositional reasoning. Um, each component uh, provides abstractions, and, and we need a hierarchical compositional uh, reasoning uh, to prove properties of the whole system. So the question is, how can we do abstraction and composition, uh, compositional reasoning for non-symbolic programs? So the list is actually very long. Here, I only give you a few examples demonstrating the challenges for security at the learning level. And also, we have many open challenges for security at the distributed level for learning systems. At the distributed level, each agent makes local decisions. The question is how to make good local decisions to achieve good global decisions. So far, we've looked at um, one aspect of machine learning in the presence of attackers. How attacker can attack the integrity of the learning system, the different types of attacks, and the challenges in defending against these attacks. So now let me move on to the uh, 
Next aspect, how attackers can actually attack the confidentiality of the learning system to try to learn sensitive information about individuals. As we all know, the data is the new oil today, and a lot of this data is unfortunately very sensitive. So as we uh, develop data analysis and machine learning over the sensitive data, uh, it can uh, cause uh, uh, essentially challenges and issues in uh, security and privacy. So this is today how uh, the, uh, today's framework for data analytics and machine learning works. User's data is being collected, and then the analyst writes analytics and machine learning programs, uh, which then are run over the computation infrastructure, over the sensitive data, to try to produce the final results, including uh, the data an analytics results as well as the trained machine learning models. However, today's frameworks for data analytics and machine learning are insufficient for protecting user data's security and privacy for a number of reasons. In particular, there are several different types of threats that we need to pay attention to. The first type of threat is untrusted program. So the analytics and machine learning programs uh, provided by the analysts actually can maybe untrusted, for example, due to insider attack, or the analyst account may have been compromised and misused by attackers. And hence, these analytics and machine learning program can actually be untrusted and try to steal users' sensitive information. Secondly, the computation infrastructure itself may be untrusted as well due to uh, compromises by attackers. And hence, as a computation task is being run on this computation infrastructure, attackers can try to steal sensitive information. And finally, the computation results itself may reveal sensitive information about the original input as well, because after all, the computation results is computed from the original sensitive information. And hence, naturally, it could contain sensitive information about the original input. To address these three different types of threats, we need to develop and utilize different types of techniques and solutions. And we have developed different techniques uh, to address these different types of threats. To address the threats of computation results revealing sensitive information about the inputs, we have developed new techniques and tools for differential privacy. To address the challenge of untrusted program, we have developed techniques for program rewriting and verification so that we can automatically rewrite an untrusted program to a rewritten version such that we can ensure that the rewritten program will automatically satisfy the desired security and privacy requirements. Finally, to address the threat of untrusted infrastructure, we utilize state-of-the-art technologies for secure computation. So first, let's look at uh, the issue of computation results revealing sensitive information about the input and what we can do about it. So many of us here train neural networks. And as we all know, neural networks has a very high capacity. And people have, want, have been wondering about whether the neural networks actually remember the training data. And here, from the security perspective, a key question is, so do neural networks remember training data? And if yes, can attackers actually exploit this to extract the secrets in the training data from just simply querying the learned models? In our recent work in collaboration with the researchers from Google, <coughs> we have uh, set out to explore uh, these questions. So in one of our studies, we studied uh, uh, the task of learning a language model. In particular, in this case, we train a language model on an email data set. In this case, it's uh, an email data set called the Enron data set. The Enron data set naturally contains actual users' credit card and social security numbers. In our, in our work, we showed that uh, from training a language model on this Enron email data set, an attacker can, uh, uh, using our newly developed attacks, an attacker, by just querying the learned language model, can actually extract the original credit card and social security numbers just by, again, querying the learned models. 
And also we propose a new measure called exposure to measure the degree of memorization uh, of these learned models, which also has been used in Google Smart Compose to uh, try to address this issue. So this example study demonstrates that when we train machine learning models over sensitive data, we need to be really careful uh, to protect users' uh, privacy. The good news here is that we actually do have a solution to this problem. In our work that we demonstrate that in the, uh, instead of just training a vanilla a language model, if you actually train a differentially private uh, language model in this case, then the problem can be largely mitigated. Uh, that we can empirically show that the exposure, the measure exposure is low, and also our proposed attacks are unable to extract the secrets. Differential privacy is a formal notion of privacy. Uh, here's a, uh, at a high level uh, to understand what differential privacy does. Uh, we, uh, in the notion of differential privacy, here we consider two uh, what we call neighboring databases, which only has one data point that is different. So for example, uh, database one uh, here uh, database two here has one additional data point, Joe's data, uh, different from the database one. So when the analyst issues a query over these two neighboring databases, we see that the, uh, 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 the analytics algorithm of the query in this case is differentially private if the query result from these two neighboring databases are very, very similar in the probability distribution uh, 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 setting. And essentially, at a high level, to understand the differential privacy notion is that the outputs from the two computation, from the two neighboring, two neighboring databases are close. And hence, even for an attacker, the attacker can now distinguish whether Joe uh, is in the database or not uh, that is used to generate the uh, the query result. And hence, in this case, uh, we are able to protect the uh, privacy of the user. So differential privacy is a very uh, useful notion for protecting users' privacy. However, there has been limited real-world use of differential privacy uh, in the more general setting. So both Google and Apple has deployed differential privacy in uh, targeted specialized applications. However, uh, it's beneficial to have broader real-world deployments of differential privacy for more general purpose analytics and machine learning. There are a number of challenges for deploying differential privacy. Uh, we need to have better usability uh, to enable uh, non-experts to be able to use differential privacy. We need to have broad support for analytics queries and machine learning task uh, workloads. And we need to have easy integration with existing data environments. No previous system addressed these issues. In our recent work with collaboration with Uber, we have de uh, developed new techniques and tools to address these challenges. Uh, in our work, we uh, uh, actually enable an automatic query rewriting system uh, for uh, data, analytics, uh, data analytics queries that can automatically rewrite an untrusted query to automatically embed differential privacy mechanisms into the rewritten query that we call an intrinsically private query. When this intrinsically private query gets executed on the original database, it will then automatically produce differentially private results. So using this approach, we can enable differential privacy without changing the workflow of the original analyst. The original analyst does not even need to know about differential privacy, and we can automatically enable a differentially private query using this query writing approach. Also, we have developed new methods for differentially private machine learning. There has been a, a huge volume of work in differentially private machine learning as well, and again, with a very little practical deployments. Uh, we have developed uh, new, uh, new methods uh, on approximate minimum perturbation 
for, a, for achieving a differential privacy, for uh, complex, uh, convex uh, optimization algorithms. And in our real-world study with the real-world workloads, uh, we demonstrate that uh, differential privacy actually not only, in this case, does not hurt uh, the performance of the learning algorithms on real-world workloads, and in certain cases, it can even help improve accuracy. And also in our uh, recent work, uh, we are extending the uh, query writing work to uh, extend it to uh, machine learning pipelines as well to automatically rewrite machine learning pipelines to ensure that they satisfy differential privacy as well. And again, some of our work has been deployed uh, at Uber uh, operating on real-world data analytics uh, queries. So that's how we can use differential privacy and program rewriting and verification to address the threats of uh, computation outputs leaking sensitive information as well as the uh, threat of untrusted program. So now let me just talk a little bit about how we can address the remaining threats of computation on uh, over uh, untrusted un infrastructure uh, by utilizing secure computation. So the goal of secure computation is to protect the computation process from leaking information about sensitive data. And there are two different uh, types of solutions we can use, crypto-based or hardware-based approach. Crypto-based approaches such as fully homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation uh, their main challenge is uh, high performance overheads. They can have orders of magnitude performance overhead over native computation. With hardware based uh, secure computation, uh, for example, utilizing abstraction called trusted execution environments, uh, we can, it actually can achieve very practical performance, where the performance is essentially close to native performance overhead. In the uh, utilizing trusted execution environments, so these are essentially hardware-based mechanisms, uh, for example, called Secure Enclave, we can run the machine learning program inside the Secure Enclave. The outside operating system and other processes actually uh, will not be able to tamper with the execution of the uh, program inside the Secure Enclave, and hence provide integrity. And also, uh, they will not be able to learn uh, the, what's running inside the state and also the execution of the program inside the secure enclave, and hence produce, uh, provides confidentiality. And also the secure enclave provides a hardware-based mechanism called the remote attestation to allow <coughs> a remote verifier to attest, to verify uh, that the correct program has run inside the secure enclave with the correct initial state. In fact, secure enclave uh, can serve as a cornerstone for security, uh, as a cornerstone security primitive. It can provide strong security capabilities. It can authenticate itself, the device. It can authenticate the software or program that's run in the secure enclave. And can guarantee uh, integrity and, uh, and confidentiality of the execution. And secure enclave can actually provide a platform for building new security applications that couldn't be built otherwise for the same practical performance. And in our recent work, we also actually demonstrate that we can actually run these deep neural networks inside the secure enclave, uh, achieving uh, close to native performance. All the hardware manufacturers have recognized the importance of building secure hardware. So over the years, they have all been developing different solutions for secure hardware. However, we still have open challenges in secure hardware. So for example, how secure can it be? And what their models? And what would you interest uh, with the uh, secure hardware? And the ultimate question is, can we create trustworthy secure enclave as a cornerstone security primitive that is widely deployed to, uh, to enable secure systems to build on top? If we can do this, we can enter a, a new secure uh, computation era. So what's the path to a trustworthy secure enclave? We have several steps. One is that we need an open source design for a secure enclave. With the open source design of a secure enclave, it can provide the transparency that's needed for the entire community to 
uh, analyze and verify the correctness and the security of the secure enclave, it has to enable high assurance needed uh, for the secure enclave. And also this helps build a whole community. And also ideally we would like to have formal verification of the open source design, and we need to ensure secure supply chain management for the uh, hardware manufacturing process. In our recent project called Keystone, in collaboration between Berkeley and MIT and other uh, university collaborators, we are developing an open source secure enclave, uh, providing a full stack open source hardware enclave implementation for uh, RISC V, which is an open source risk architecture developed at Berkeley. And we plan to have our first release uh, this fall. And the RISC V, uh, the uh, open source risk architecture, has been widely adopted in industry. The RISC V Foundation has over 100 uh, top industry uh, members. So by putting all this together, now we can provide uh, a platform for secure and privacy-preserving shared learning. Users' data in this case will be stored in the encrypted manner, and the untrusted uh, data analytics and machine learning pipelines will be automatically rewritten in our platform, and our platform will do the secure computation uh, on the computation infrastructure utilizing secure hardware as well as crypto-based methods, and in the end, to automatically produce the differentially private results. So with this approach, uh, we can provide much stronger security and privacy protection for users' data. Now the data owner no longer needs to trust the data analysts or the computation infrastructure for the security and privacy of their data. So I've talked about the first aspects, how attackers may attack the AI, both in terms of integrity and confidentiality, and what kind of techniques we can use to help address these problems. Another important aspect is how attackers may misuse AI. So we have seen that attackers can misuse AI for large-scale, automated, and targeted manipulation. And also from the recent Cambridge Analytica and the Facebook issues, we have learned that leaked data can have very long-term consequences. Once the data is leaked, the uh, leaked data can be used for, uh, uh, for, for misuse even many years down the road. And moreover, today users are losing control of their valuable data. The data is used for learning and influencing users' behaviors, and users don't know what their data is used for, they don't get paid for the data, and they can't take the data back. Moreover, as we talked about AI machine learning, I think there's an even greater question for us to ponder upon. So many nation le state leaders have recognized that the importance of AI and who, uh, have recognized that whoever controls and leads in AI will rule the world. So the question is who is uh, leading and controlling AI today and who will be doing that in the future? So the status quo today is that we have big companies that are collecting users' data, and they use this data to uh, provide personal assistance to users. And the question is actually who will be running our lives? So these assistants that's trained uh, and operated by the big companies, ultimately their goal is to maximize uh, company revenue, despite the good intentions. So the question is, is there a different future? Is there a different future where we can develop intelligent agents and virtual assistants that are under user control? They can provide the assistance to users, but the difference is that they will be maximizing user value. And they can still leverage third-party services uh, provided by other companies. So the question is, how can we do this? At Oasis Labs, we are developing a new, uh, a new solution uh, by building a privacy-first cloud computing on blockchain, and with the goal to provide better privacy as well as towards democratization of AI. By utilizing the techniques that I have, I have described in the earlier part of the, uh, my talk, we are building a new solution, uh, a new primitive called the privacy-preserving smart contract. 
This privacy preserving smart contract runs on top of a blockchain so that it can uh, do enforcement without relying on any central party. Within the privacy preserving smart contract, we can specify codes for training machine learning models as well as serving machine learning models. Users can, uh, the, the smart contract can specify terms of use, for example, how user's data is being used. Uh, that can enforce that the data, uh, user's data can only be used for specific purposes, such as training machine learning models, and also can specify terms of use, for example, how users may be compensated uh, for their data. By contributing their data to a privacy-preserving smart contract, users get to maintain control of their data, and, uh, and also their privacy will be protected, and the users can gain benefits from contributing data as specified in smart contracts. And also using this approach, we can significantly reduce the friction for, uh, uh, for essentially uh, training machine learning models across uh, data from different data sources. For example, in the setting of medical research. And again, oops. As I mentioned, uh, using the techniques that I mentioned earlier, we can utilize secure computation and differential privacy as well as other techniques to enforce privacy-preserving smart contracts. And also, by running it on the blockchain, we can provide all these enforcements without requiring uh, or relying the trust of any central party. And in our... Uh, 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 in our concrete example, we are developing uh, an application together in collaboration with uh, researchers from uh, Stanford Medical Center as well as uh, from ETH and uh, Berkeley. Uh, in this concrete uh, uh, application example, Kara, we are developing a privacy-preserving tokenized data markets for medical data on top of the OSS uh, blockchain platform. Medical data is locked in data silos. Uh, the goal is to incentivize doctors and patients to share data and improve medical research. In general, it's very difficult for medical researchers to get access to patients' data to uh, develop machine learning models, to try to find better cures for diseases due to the privacy and security uh, concerns. By utilizing privacy-preserving smart contracts uh, on top of the OSIS platform blockchain, we can... Uh, Essentially, uh, we are developing this uh, application to uh, help uh, so where patients can automatically contribute their data to the privacy-preserving smart contract, which contains the machine learning models that medical research want to train. And uh, uh, medical research in this way can get to train their machine learning models uh, while preserving the uh, user's privacy, and also users now uh, can get rewards from contributing their data. And also, altogether, uh, users' data can be now used for greater societal goods uh, while still maintaining control of their data. So overall, by utilizing privacy-preserving smart contracts uh, with the OASIS blockchain platform, we hope to enable uh, many different these intelligent smart contracts, these uh, AI machine learning agents, to run on top of the blockchain platform. At the same time, it can uh, protect users' privacy and also help users to maintain control of their privacy, as well as providing now these machine learning agents that are actually under users' control. And we hope that this, uh, this solution can help lead to democratization of AI. To summarize, in this talk, I have talked about uh, many different uh, uh, exciting open challenges and questions at the intersection between AI and the security. On one hand, AI enables new security capabilities. On the other hand, security can enable better AI by providing integrity and confidentiality uh, protection for AI, as well as can help prevent misuse of AI. There are many uh, remaining uh, open challenges at the intersection between AI and the security how to better understand what security means for AI and learning systems, how to detect when a learning system has been fooled or compromised, how to build more resilient learning systems with stronger guarantees, how to build privacy-preserving learning systems, and how to democratize AI. 
And this work is joint uh, work with many of my fantastic students and great collaborators. And the Keystone Open Source Secure Enclave design is in collaboration between Berkeley and MIT and other university collaborators. And also, we just launched the Oasis Labs uh, yesterday uh, to build a privacy-first, high-performance cloud computing platform on blockchain. I strongly believe that security be, will be one of the biggest challenges in deploying AI. It requires a community effort. Let's tackle the big challenges together. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, please use the microphones, come up to the microphones for the questions. Any questions? Also, while we have the questions uh, being set up, I just want to put an announcement. Uh, we have our program synthesis uh, workshop on Sunday. Please see us there. Hi, uh, thank you for a very timely and inspiring talk. I was wondering, uh, as a community, how can we make it clear to the, you know, the community at large and regulators and sponsors in particular that these capabilities exist and how they can match up with their requirements? Uh, uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Okay, so the community at large has trouble understanding a lot of the challenges that AI poses and that these, even these capabilities around privacy exist. There's a lot of hype and a lot of misunderstanding. As an AI community, what can we be doing to better inform the community at large and especially the regulators that there are these kinds of solutions to these challenges that some, some of them have fears about? Uh, that's a very good question. I think, so that's why I'm really glad that uh, uh, actually have the opportunity to, uh, to give this uh, talk here is that I think as the AI community there's a lot to understand in terms of the security and privacy challenges as we deploy AI and as we develop new AI uh, technologies uh, in, the, uh, in the world. And the good thing is that we're actually seeing that both in terms of the whole community as well as the regulators are becoming to understand the issues better and becoming more aware of these issues. For example, the recent uh, uh, European the GDPR regulation actually is a great step forward. And inside the GDPR, uh, the, uh, uh, the document actually has, for example, even mentioned about differential privacy as well. Uh, so I think these are great steps forward. Uh, and definitely, I think it requires, as, well, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it really requires a community effort. I think uh, it's great for all of us to actually try to help raise the awareness about security and privacy issues uh, when it comes to deploying AI in the whole community. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the gr uh, great talk. I have a specific question about uh, the adversary uh, uh, examples you showed. So, uh, so the. You basically treated the classification problem like a stop sign was speed limit. So my question is, if you learn, have you tried to learn structured output, let's say character level, STOP, instead of treated as classification problem? Would that improve the, um, you know, the resilience to attacks? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so the examples that I showed here, due to the time limit, they are just a few examples. Uh, so there has been a lot of study in adversarial uh, deep learning. And uh, we can talk this offline. And in general, uh, there are so a lot of these different uh, deep learning systems are vulnerable to adversarial examples. Although with that said, so we do have a paper coming up at the ECCV uh, actually uh, proposing one defense that I didn't have time to talk about in my talk. It's not from a structured output, but we are showing, essentially using what we call consistency checks, where you do these, uh, 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 for example, when you try to do segmentation, uh, by actually looking at consistency checks from different uh, subsamples of the segmentation uh, outputs, we can try to detect uh, inconsistencies and using that to detect adversarial examples. And that actually has been shown to, uh, we showed to have great results. Uh, so you can write. So, yeah, welcome to look more in the paper as well yeah, as one example much. of this. So let's take one more question while the uh, next speakers for the best paper plenary are coming up. Hi. 
Yeah, so uh, I was wondering what were your thoughts in terms of uh, the adversarial... Sorry, I'm here. Hello. Thank you. Yes, I was wondering what were your thoughts for the adversarial examples. You gave a lot of examples from uh, deep learning, adversarial de deep learning, but is there a qualitative difference for these results with just, uh, say, like random forests or kernel methods in terms of uh, what people have observed? Yeah, so every example is not unique to deep learning, and in fact, most uh, machine learning models actually suffer uh, from issues. Uh, yeah, so it's not unique for deep learning. And we are talking about deep learning just because it's the most, uh, you know, for many tasks, it's a city of the art results, and hence, it's particularly important to understand adversary examples in a deep learning setting. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank Don once more for a wonderful talk.